Good morning. Welcome to worship with us here at Calvary Lutheran. We're glad to have you uh, in, in this, this hour or so of worship with us today. Today in our service, we're going to be asking the question, where are you running? And we're going to be reflecting on the voice of God and thinking about the presence of God. When you hear the voice of God, when you are in the presence of God, where do you run? Do you run to Him? Do you run away from Him? And on that, that topic, I want to share this passage from John 10:27. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And is that always the case? Are we always following? So with that in mind, we will unpack that a little bit more as the service um, begins. But for now, um, I invite you to stand as we run toward God in praise for our opening sentences. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is true. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. At this time, we, be, we continue with our entrance hymn. Just as we run toward Jesus in song, we also run toward him as we confess who we believe him to be, as we now confess the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That today, as we focus on running toward Jesus, is that we also take time to confess the moments that we have run from Him, is that because of our sin and our shame, 
So we also now take a moment of silent, silence and reflect and confess to bring before him those actions that led us to run from his presence. That in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells the following parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after, after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, that he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors. And together, he calls them together and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And Jesus rejoices as you return to him in repentance and as you run to him now. So as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we continue with our hymn of praise. Let us pray. That Father God, you have caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. As we take time today to run to you in your word, grant that we may so hear, read, mark, learn, and take to heart your word. That we pray that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and hold fast the blessed hope and everlasting, uh, everla the hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So today's Old Testament reading and the text for today's sermon comes to us from the third chapter of Genesis. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. That he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? 
The man said, The woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This time we now invite, do we have any children? I see one. All right, we're going to have our children's message. And Pastor Ebert, you may need to have the computer volume on if, if you don't have that. All right, hi Paisley, how are you? Okay, Paisley, I'm glad you're here because I need some help. I've got some, some voice recordings that I'm going to play. Okay, they're going to play over the speakers. And I want you to tell me if you know who they are, okay? All right, and congregation, you guys can play along as well. Maybe if you want to whisper to the person next to you, that's fine. Um, so here we go. Here is our first voice recording. <laughs> All right, do you know who that is? Does anybody? Who? SpongeBob. That's SpongeBob SquarePants. That's his voice, his very kind of obnoxious laugh. All right, we'll see if we can get this, this next one. Meep. What's up, Doc? And what's up, Doc? All right, what's I think up, we can cut Doc? it there. All right. Meep. What's up, Doc? <laughs> there we go. All right. Paisley, do you know who, who says what's up, Doc? Okay. Does anybody out there know who that is? Bugs Bunny, right? You guys know SpongeBob's voice and you know Bugs Bunny's voice. All right, we've got one more voice for us. I'd love to talk to you. Ah, uh, <laughs> well, uh, do you know this? One? Here we are. Ah, uh, <laughs> guess you're a little shy. All right, that's I'm good. Ready. Thank you. All right, Paisley, do you know who this is? That's Mickey Mouse, right? Okay, when you hear some of these voices. Sometimes you can hear somebody's voice and you know who it is, right? And when you hear somebody's voice and you know who it is, you know, you kind of have a reaction where you're like, oh, I know that person. I love that person. Or I know that person and I might, maybe if you heard SpongeBob's voice, you were kind of terrified because it's, it's a little bit too much, right? Sometimes you hear a voice and you think, oh, I know that person. I love that person. I want to run toward that person. And sometimes we hear somebody's voice and we think, I'm not sure who that is. I'm not sure what they're saying to me. I'm not sure what that person has to do with me. And so we turn and we might run the other direction. So Paisley, what we are getting at here is we want to make sure that we always know and we always remember that when we hear the voice of God, do you think that's somebody you run away from or someone you run toward? Toward, right? Yeah, so we can run toward God in a whole bunch of ways. We run toward God when we pray to him. We run toward God when we say, God, I know I've got some sin, and I know that you're the only person who can fix it. So whenever we hear God's voice, whenever we feel like God is near us, we always want to make sure that we run toward God. So let's go ahead, let's fold our hands, and let's pray, and we'll do a repeat-after-me prayer with the entire congregation. Dear God, thank you for your voice. Thank you for the comfort that it always gives me. Help me to run to you. Amen. All right. At this time, we will now continue on with our New Testament reading. Our New Testament reading today comes from the book of Romans. This is Romans chapter 16, chapter 16 verses 17 through 20, and it says this. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. 
For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to be to God. All right, today we're talking about sounds, sounds and, and voices. And have you ever thought about how a small sound can create or elicit a very big response? You might hear a very, very small sound, and you might have a very, very big response. This response can, can take, take form in a couple of different ways. You might have a very external response, a very physical response where you hear something and you feel like you need to jump out of your seat and go and do something about it. You might have a very internal response where you hear a very small sound and all of a sudden the gears in your mind begin to turn, your emotions start moving, you know, things are happening inside you even if they're not happening externally outside of you. You might hear a very small sound and you might have a very negative response. It might bring sorrow and and sadness or, or fear. You might hear a very small sound and have a very positive response. Now, I want to give you a few examples of a very small sound creating a very big response. And I've got two of them. The first one, for me personally, are whispers. When I hear whispers, again, it's a very small sound. It gives me a very big internal and positive response. Because when I think of whispers, it takes me back to the couple of summers when I worked at Camp Lakeview as a counselor. Now, when you work there, you begin to learn that every morning starts the exact same. And here's how your morning routine goes at camp. Um, You begin to start hearing the kids kind of moving around in their bed. They start to kind of, they're waking up, they've got the wiggles, they can't just lay there. They have to kind of move around. So you kind of hear their, their blankets shuffling around. And then you begin to hear the whispers. And it always goes something like this. It always goes like, Johnny, Johnny, are you awake? Jimmy, can you see if Johnny's awake? Oh, he's not. Okay, can you wake him up real quick? Johnny, do you want to go play tetherball? And it always goes like that. It always starts off with the the blankets and the bed, and then it's the whispering, and the whispering always then leads to tetherball. And then from the whispering, then you begin to hear the kids climbing out of their bunks, and it's kind of creaking because they're old beds. And then you hear their feet shuffling across the floor. And then you, they make their way towards the door. And again, they're trying to be as quiet as they can because they don't want to wake anybody up, but they really want to go play tetherball. So they make their way to the door, and those cabin doors, they all open out. And they're on a spring. So they're super quiet. They get to that door. They push it open. They step out. And then they let go of the door, and it slams shut. And all of the effort that they had taken to be as quiet as they could trying to leave the cabin now just flies out the door with them on their way to go play tetherball. So when I hear whispering, you know, I'm thinking about all this, this kind of mourning process. And it's, it's a very internal positive response for me because I look back on that time, you know, very fondly. Another one for me, which a, a very small sound creates a big response, are when I hear voices. You know, we talked about this a little bit in the children's message Sometimes you can hear somebody's voice without actually hearing it. Like if I were to say, you know, picture Donald Duck's voice in your mind, you can probably do that. Or if I were to say, hey, I want you to try to hear your grandmother or your grandfather's voice in your mind, you can probably hear that. Or even I'm lucky enough where I've got, um, you know, one of my grandfathers who's passed away, he's, he left me multiple voice messages on my phone, and, you know, I still have that phone, and I can go back, and I can listen to those voice messages, and when I hear those, again, it's just, you know, him saying, hello, how are you, call me back if you get a chance, very small sound, but a very big, positive, internal response for me. Now, our reading in Genesis is another really great example of a small sound creating a big response. Because Adam and Eve are in the garden. They were, you know, it wasn't too long ago that they were created. And everything in the garden, we're told by God that it was good. Everything was perfect. Adam and Eve, they had everything that they needed. God had created for them. He had been providing for them. And Adam and Eve and God, they were in perfect community with each other. 
We have no reason to believe that when Adam and Eve would begin to hear God coming, God approaching, they would begin to realize that they were going to be in the presence of God. We've got no reason to believe that they would do anything other than just sprint to God. Say, God, here I am. What are we doing today? What, 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 what's, what's going on? What are we doing? Right, it was very positive. It was all good. It was all perfect. But in our reading today, we kind of come in right after Adam and Eve have, have eaten the forbidden fruit and sin has entered the world and along with that sin, some other things have entered the world. So they, they hear God and they have a new reaction. Very small sound, new reaction, new response. No longer are they running toward God. For the very first time, Adam and Eve hear God coming and they're going to run away from God. This happens for a couple different reasons. They, sin enters the world and they begin to realize that they're naked. And they feel like they need to cover up. And so for the first time now, they're feeling shame. So they take leaves and they're, they're covering themselves. But not only are they trying to cover you know, parts of their body, but they're also trying to hide and cover up themselves entirely. They realize for the first time that they're feeling fear. God is coming and no longer is it a moment of joy. It's a moment of fear. So they're not going to run to him. They're going to run away from him into the trees to try to hide their shame, to hide their fear, and to hide their sin. Now, God finds them, and he, God addresses Adam and Eve, and he does so one by one. He, he starts with Adam, and he says, Adam, what's happened? What have you done? What's going on? And Adam looks at God, and this is where things begin to really unravel. Because Adam looks at God, and he says, well, the woman, the woman gave me the fruit. The woman caused me to sin. So he points the finger of blame at Eve. But not only does Adam point the finger of blame at Eve, he says, the woman who, by the way, God, you placed here, she gave me the fruit. So not only is Adam pointing the finger at Eve, he's also pointing the finger at God. Now, God doesn't give that any kind of response. He moves on from Adam and he goes over to Eve and he goes and he asks Eve the exact same question. He says, Eve, what's happened? What have you done? What's going on? Eve looks at God and gives the exact same response that Adam does. She takes a page right out of Adam's book and points the finger of blame, not at Adam, not at God, but says, the serpent. The serpent deceived me and caused me to sin. Now, when we look at it this way, it's kind of a, a comical thing where like, this person's pointing at this person, this point, person is pointing at this person, and this person is pointing at this person. But the thing we have to remember is, this is our family history. This is where you come from. This is where I come from. And we've got no reason to believe that we would have done any better, that we would have handled the situation any better than Adam and Eve would have. You see, Adam and Eve, they heard God coming and they didn't want to, to show their sin to him, so they decided they were going to hide. They're going to hide and conceal their sin, and so they go and they hide in the trees. Now, we do the exact same thing. We try to hide our sin. We try to conceal our sin. We just think that we're really, really good at it. We don't try to hide and conceal our sin in things like you know, physical places. We, we've gotten really crafty where we try to hide and conceal our sin in things like anonymity trying to hide our sin and things like just being anonymous. We tell ourselves things like, I can, I can say or post or comment whatever I want as long as I don't attach my real name to it. It can't be traced back to me. It's not like I ever said it. We try to hide our sin in things like being anonymous. Or we try to hide our sin in things like time and frequency where we tell ourselves things like, I can do this bad thing but only if I do it only every so often. As long as I do this bad thing, you know, like just here and just there, and I kind of pick and choose my places, nobody's going to care, and probably nobody will even notice. But we know even if we're trying to do something anonymously, doing something wrong anonymously, like God knows. God, God knows how to trace it back to us. We know that even if we're trying to do something very infrequently, like God cares and God notices. Sometimes, you know, we're, it's easy to point fingers at Adam and Eve, but it's sometimes we do something arguably even worse than Adam and Eve. Because they try to hide their sin. Sometimes we don't even try to hide our sin. Sometimes we just try to justify our sin. We tell ourselves things like, you know, the bad thing that I did to that person was actually okay because that person 
got what they deserved. Or we tell ourselves things like, you know, the bad thing that I did to that person or that bad thing that I shouldn't have done, excuse me, the bad thing that I shouldn't have done, when I did that bad thing, it actually taught this person a lesson that they needed to learn. So in a way, I didn't do a bad thing, I did a good thing. I helped them out. So it's really easy to look at Adam and Eve and think, wow, they, they really let this thing get away from them. But the truth is, we don't have any, believe, any reason to believe that we would have done anything any better. So how does this play out for, for Adam and Eve when they try to hide their sin? How does that play out for you and me as well? So Adam and Eve, the, the, you know, they, they feel shame, they feel fear, they have sinned, they're lying, they're pointing the finger of blame at all sorts of people, and this opens up this huge opportunity for God, for God to look at all of these errors, all of these mistakes, all of these wrong turns, and to say, here is my grace. Here is my love. If you had any doubts, here is how I really feel about you. When Adam and Eve heard God coming, they ran the opposite direction. God could have just said, okay, you run that way, I'll run that way, and that's it. When Adam and Eve ran the other way, God could have chased them down, picked them up, placed them out of the Garden of Eden, and said, okay, hopelessness for the rest of your days. For the rest of your life, you're going to live outside of the Garden of Eden, away from me, outside of all of the good things that I've created for you, and you're not going to have any hope as you go about it. But that's not what God does, right? This creates an opportunity for God to show his grace. And he, when Adam and Eve run away from him, he pursues them. And while everybody is pointing the finger of blame at somebody else, while nobody wants to own their own sin, and they're pointing at somebody else who should own that sin for them, for the first time in Scripture, God points at the one person who will own the sin for everybody, when he points at Jesus. This comes in verse 15. This is Genesis 3.15, and here's what it says. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, you may have noticed that when we read this passage earlier, we were reading from the ESV translation. This is the NIV, and they've got some different words in the verbs here. And so I wanted to use this because I think these verbs are really telling. So in this this passage, you've got God who is talking, and he's actually addressing Satan. And here's what he says to Satan. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He's saying, I will... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And he, the offspring of Eve, will crush your Satan's head. So God is looking at Satan and saying, Jesus Christ is going to come into the world. When he does, he is going to crush your head, Satan. And further he says, and you, Satan, you will just strike his heel. Jesus is going to crush Satan's head. Satan is only going to strike his heel. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had to choose between the two, between having somebody strike my heel or having somebody crush my head, hands down, 10 times out of 10, I'm going to pick for somebody to only strike my heel. Why? It's very simple. Because I don't want my head crushed. That's it. Because when you have your head crushed, like, that's it. That's game over. The lights are off. They don't come back on. There's no coming back from a crushed head. But here's the thing, that is the promise that God is now making to Adam and Eve and the promise that God is now making to you here as well. That it will be game over for Satan. That his head will be crushed. The lights will not come back on. That he's going to send Jesus into the world, the only person who's capable of owning our sin that nobody else wants to own, and he's going to crush Satan's head, and that will be it. And that is done for Adam and Eve, and that is going to be done for you. Now, when Adam and Eve heard God coming um, in, the, in the garden, for the first time ever, they ran away. And they ran away because, for the first time ever, they are worried about what is God going to do to them, instead of asking the question, well, what is God going to do for me? And in this moment, God you know, looks at Adam and Eve and says, yes, something's going to happen to you because there is a consequence for sin here on earth. But he says, I'm less worried about what I'm going to do to you, and I'm much more concerned in what I'm going to do for you. And that's when he's pointing to Jesus and saying, even though you don't want to own your sin, here comes my son who will own your sin. And he's pointing at Jesus and saying, 
this is how I'm going to love you. He said, this is what Jesus is for, to own your sin. This is what the forgiveness is for. Because there's nothing that God wants to see more than to see that garden restored. There's nothing that he wants to see more than to be in full and complete community with his creation, with you. There's nothing that God wants to see more than to have that beautiful parent moment where you, you go to school to pick up your child and your child runs and bursts out of the school doors and sees your car and sees your face and they sprint towards you with enough you know, energy and joy and love, like coming in full speed for that hug and that embrace so hard that it could just knock both of you to the ground. That is what God is saying he wants for us. He wants us to be in complete community with him. He wants us, he wants to, to come to, close to us and say, where are you? And for you to say, here I am, God. Here I am. Now this, this idea that, that God wants to be in complete community again, that he wants to restore the garden, that's not just something that we point towards in the future. Yes, that's, that's a, a heavenly reality, but that's something that God wants for us right here and right now. Now you, you may have noticed that We've been using some very specific language so far in our service where we've been saying, we now run to God to do this. We now run to God as we confess who we believe him to be. We now run to God as we confess our sins to him. Well, now we're going to end our service as we run to God. Or I'm sorry, we're going to end our sermon as we run to God in another way in prayer. So will you please bow your heads, fold your hands, and pray with me as we run to God in prayer as our source of comfort. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that even when we run from you, you still pursue us. We thank you for giving your son Jesus on the cross for us so that we can be in community with you. We pray that in all circumstances we would remember your promises and find comfort in your presence. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now continue on with our hymn of the day.
At this time now in our service, we pause just to give a couple of brief announcements and invitations. Um, our first announcement that we want to make sure we uh, get out there is that today we have our congregational voters meeting. That'll happen not after this service, but after our late service, the 1045 service. Um, at that meeting, all are invited to, to come and hear about some of the different things that are happening at Calvary. We're going to be voting to approve our budget, voting on our new ministry leaders, um, on our different ministry teams. And then we'll also be talking about a couple of other items as well. So we'd love to have you stick around after, after that service if you'd like to come back um, and be part of that. Additionally, um, today is our, this week is our last chance for many of us to sign up for a men's Bible study or a women's Bible study. If you'd like more information on either of those opportunities, um, I'd invite you to check out your information page within your bulletin. And then finally, Pastor Ebert has uh, an announcement that he would like to make as well. That we wanted to update the congregation is that we know this last year and a half has been a little different for everyone, but we do recognize that throughout uh, this is that we thank you for continuing uh, to support our congregation and all things to continue to be supportive of one another. As that throughout this whole pandemic process, we've tried to have kind of that threefold philosophy of how we've approached things. So that first off, we wanted to create not only a meaningful worshipful space, but that was also healthy and safe as well. And thus far, we have been able to very successfully do that as a congregation. So that also, we've sought to, to be honoring and respectful of those uh, local and state mandates and guidance regarding the pandemic, as well as then finally, as if we've continued to care for and respect one another. Is that knowing that not every situation or everyone's uh, just specific uh, view and perspective is the same, but how is it that we as a group and as a collective whole are approaching this, especially in care for those who are uh, the vulnerable among us. But we do realize that many things have changed, is that not only are more and more people getting vaccinated, but we also see a continued decline in cases, as well as then, as you may have heard within the news, is that anticipated tomorrow evening at the City County Council is that there will be up for the vote a change within the Marion County mask mandate. Is that at that meeting they are recommending uh, that Marion County fall in line with the CDC guidelines, that those who are vaccinated do not have that mask requirement you know, when in public spaces. And so Calvary has continued to weigh our continued uh, way forward within that. And so we want to just share with you uh, that announcement now. That what we are going to be doing is kind of knowing that we have different perspectives, we have different situations that are there. As the pastors in spiritual care have set forward this plan uh, for this time forward, is that for our Saturday night service, for the next two weeks for a trial basis is that we are going to continue our Saturday evening service to be a mask required service for those who are either because of personal vulnerability or situations or just because they are still preferring to have a more cautious uh, regard to what is going on is that that service will remain at this time for the next two weeks a mask required service but our Sunday morning services will now transition starting next week anticipating that Marion County change tomorrow night is that we'll move to a mask optional service for those who are vaccinated. And so that will begin next week at our 8 and our 1045 Sunday morning services is that also when it comes to Bible studies as that that will also uh, be a mask optional reality unless your specific small group or individual study that is meeting here at Calvary decide as a group that we would like to you know keep that uh, personal restriction for our Bible study in place that is you know, up to your group to go ahead and decide and discuss that together. But overall is that we thank you and appreciate the ways that you've gone, gone through to care for one another, as well as to continue to support our church here, is that you'll see over these up, next upcoming weeks other changes as we anticipate uh, moving uh, to more of a, uh, nor moving towards a more normal communion distribution, as well as some of the other things that we see in the weeks ahead as we continue to head back to a more normal situation. But with all of these things is that we want to be continuing to hear from you and be in conversation. So if you do have any concerns, questions, or uh, things that you would like to discuss, please catch one of the pastors after services or sometime during the week, or also feel free to reach out to one of our spiritual care members is that we are glad to hear your perspectives and to continue that conversation as we care for that group and community as we move forward. So thank you for those announcements. And so at this time, I invite you to please stand for prayer.
So we highlight a few special prayers today, is that we pray for Margie Mason, who is hospitalized at this time. So we also rejoice with Pastor uh, Josh Riefsteck and his wife, Laura, at the birth of their newborn baby girl, Eliza May Riefsteck, as well as we pray for God's guidance and care for our congregational voters meeting happening today, as well as for all of our leaders as we move forward as a congregation. And so let us now, uh, as we prepare for that, this, let us now turn in our hearts and our attention to our Lord. So, Father God, you sought Adam and Eve in the garden after they ate the forbidden fruit. As you did this, they ran from you in shame. Forgive us for the many ways that we run from you, and give us strength and endurance to run towards you for our every need. Lord, in your name, we run, run to you. For those that don't yet know the comfort of your presence and voice, we pray that you would make yourself known so that all would experience your goodness. Lord, in your name, we run, run to you. As our school goes on summer break, we thank you for the ministry you have enabled our teachers and staff to offer the students. During this time of break, we pray for, that the students would continue to run to you for every need. Lord, in your name, we run, run to you. For all those who travel this summer, we pray for their safety and that they would continue to run to you by any means possible while they are away. Lord, in your name, we run, run to you. For our community and neighbors, we pray that our church and school would be of service as we bring your presence into their lives. Lord, in your name, we run, run to you. For all health care providers and first responders, we thank and praise you, God that you have raised up servants for our good, and we pray for their continued protection in their work. Lord, in your name, we run to you. For all those in need of strength, healing, and recovery, we pray for your continued care and that your peace would be supplied in, their, in the process. Lord, in your name, we run to you. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remissions of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
And now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you.